Gentlemen, we got a little something, something brewing, and you know what? We got to get the Enterprise in front of it. Specifically, I'm talking about autonomous vehicles. Now, I know we've covered it to death across the Twit TV network, and yes, there's a lot of promise, and yes, there's a lot of very interesting technology, but we haven't really had a, a chance to sit down between ourselves and look at some of the, the new realities, the new technologies that are emerging, and the new strategies that enterprises and large companies are putting into place to take advantage of this revolution. Could 2018 be the year where the autonomous car becomes the normal thing? Well, let's, let's take a look. Now, there's been some interesting news that's been trickling out about this field in the past two weeks. Uber has announced that it's applying for an operation permit in California after a very well-publicized temper tantrum against the city of San Francisco in the state of California that saw Uber angrily announce that they're going to test in Arizona instead of the Golden State. Autonomous driving was a talking point at both the Game Developers Conference here in San Francisco and at the Mobile World Congress in Barcelona. A Tesla on autopilot yesterday crashed into a poorly designed barrier on a highway near Dallas, Texas, and two weeks ago, Reuters reported that GM is planning for a 2018 deployment of autonomous Chevy Bolts through a partnership with Lyft and their newly purchased Sidecar, which is a failed startup that GM snatched up. Uh, gentlemen, let's, let's start with this. Let's take it at face value. Looking at this, it's, it's easy to see that, yeah, there's a lot of money in autonomous cars. And we know from the stories that we've gotten back from, say, Intel's investment in the technology, that there's going to be a lot of data, a lot of big data points that will be coming back from these cars' sensors. But where do you think the enterprise should be positioned? Uh, Lou, for example, let me start with you. You, you represent a consumer-slash-enterprise business company. Where do you see the promise of autonomous vehicles in turning Microsoft from that sort of big conglomeration of, of uh, you know, enterprise, really enterprise-focused technologies into to one that sees the interface as more holistic from, from home to office? That's interesting. I think, you know, it's funny because on the way to work, you can actually take this thing called the connector. And, it, and when you get on the connector, it's like you're walking into a mobile office. And, you know, it, it's really kind of, you know, an hour a day I can get back to basically do my work by just having the ability to have somebody drive me there. Um, and normally people can't afford to do that themselves and moment people don't want to take uh, you know public transportation all the time so this might be a, a good alternative for them to have to own their own vehicle and also be able to you know get driven somewhere and i think i think you know that's one thing that's one of the easiest things to kind of come up with but this also goes with you know going across the industry from any type of you know i, I talked about in my predictions around you know you know the trucking industry kind of stepping into that zone of you know really changing how how things are delivered across the country and uh, delivered across, you know, even some, several other continents is, you know, when you, when you, when you allow, you know, trucks, especially that are going to be delivering goods um, internationally or subnationally, you know, that makes it uh, an interesting thing because they can continue to go and, and you know, then make those trucks, you know, economic. And, um, and then you have this, this delivery system for businesses to be able to do and not have to, you know, pay the high prices and the high, um, insurance prices of of you know truck the trucking industry and so that you know it kind of changes the the scope and the the shape of that industry as going forward. Most large industries they get they get caught up in the like the cost cutting of 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 manufacturing and development and and they don't get they don't get caught up they don't get into like the innovation side of things and I think that that's where you know this might help especially kind of get rid of that that cost cutting side of things. Actually, very, very good point. I, I think that's one of the things that we on Twite, we should focus on. It's so easy to look at this technology and think, okay, cost cutting, uh, getting rid of drivers, look at the technology in how it will apply to my business model. Not enough is being paid to, well, what does this mean 10 years down the road? If we start moving to an autonomous economy where our vehicles can drive themselves, especially cargo vehicles, well, that means that all new industries open up. That means all new opportunities open up. And I, it's the people who figure that out that are going to have the advantage in the next part of the cycle. Uh, we've got a couple of good comments in the chat room. We've got JJ the 4884 wondering if there are any dumb cars anymore. And, and this is one of the things that I think people who are versed on the subject have been trying to remind people, which is if you drive a car that was made after 2005, you're driving a smart vehicle. It's using smart brakes. It's using some sort of computer to control the engine. Even the steering is controlled by, it could be controlled via the computer. So the only thing is turning that on, allowing it to have the smarts and the sensors to know what is around it. So, you know, the transition 
technology-wise, is it actually going to be that great? The transition, what it means for the business model might be. Curtis, let me bring you into this. I, I love what Lou is saying about not just looking at cost cutting, but looking at innovation. Where do you think the innovation is going to be? We are going to be getting terabytes and terabytes of data, data points from all of these drivers and all of these vehicles. I mean, can you stare into your crystal ball and tell us what kind of new industries this might spawn? I know this is sort of like the, the trillion dollar question, but I'm going to give it to you because I'm the host of the show and I, I get to throw it to the people who are swearing at me in the in the monitor. Well, you know, it's interesting. Uh, for a lot of reasons, we tend to focus on things like the autonomous passenger vehicles, and there's nothing wrong with that. I, I think that, that those will come along, and I think those will offer some opportunities. But where I see the true opportunities for the enterprise are in commercial vehicles. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples. One is in things like uh, agriculture where there are already fully autonomous vehicles. Uh, Massey Ferguson, for example, uh, if you write them a great whopping big check, will happily sell you a very large tractor um, that can be programmed uh, to follow GPS coordinates and plow your fields for you uh, and do so with incredibly straight lines with, with tremendous precision and no human being aboard, which means um, – it can do it at night, do it 24 hours. So that's one example. Another is one, and I, I've been looking on the internet while uh, you and Lou have been talking. I saw a story very recently about a system that's coming online that will allow trucks, 18 wheelers in the US to convoy together. Now this has already been shown and demonstrated in Europe, but imagine a set of two, three, four, five, six, 18 wheelers where only the front truck has to have a driver that is fully in control of the vehicle. In the rest of them, they have drivers, but they're completely hands and feet off. What's the point? They can follow one another much closer, basically ride in one another's slipstreams. And I've seen estimates that this can uh, save something like 10 to 12% of the fuel costs of each of these trucks as they go across the country. Given the amount of fuel that's used in trucks in the U.S., this has potentially huge savings. So I think these commercial applications are the sort of place where we're going to see the initial uh, the initial deployments for a couple of reasons. The money that can come back and, to be honest, the simplicity of the environment. When you start talking about passenger vehicles, you put put those vehicles inside cities. And in conversations that I've had with engineers at Ford and General Motors, they talk about the complexity of a city street in terms of an environment in which an autonomous vehicle can work. Compared to that, the interstate is a piece of cake. So those sorts of places, the interstates, farm fields, I think those are the places to look for the first large scale autonomous vehicle deployments. Right, right. Actually, I know exactly where this is. I took this uh, this road yesterday on the way back from Moscone Center. This is down near Howard. But uh, oh, by the way, that's in San Francisco. Um, I, yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right. There, there, there are a few types of applications that are far better fits, more natural fits for this type of technology. We had High Web in the chat room saying, "Well, I mean, farming equipment, combines. Yeah, that should all be automated." Uh, we have also got JJ to the four eight eight four saying, "Yeah, you know what?" And one of the other industries is when you design these the, these devices, this technology, the software that runs it. You're going to need to make sure that it it can not be owned by an external attack. Uh, you know, uh, when we were at CES. I did stop by the Ford booth, and I, I had a really good uh, talk with the, the man who was in charge of their autonomous vehicle program. And uh, off camera, he made a very interesting comment. He said, look, we see what's happening in the Silicon Valley, and we're excited. You know, we see this technology. We see how it's being developed. We know that there's promise there, but I don't think a lot of these Silicon Valley companies realize exactly how difficult it is to implement great new technology into vehicles that actually have to exist in the real world, that deal with real people that can kill real people. You know, this is not a beta of a new email app. This is something that is a ton, two tons of steel rolling down a freeway that could really cause damage. Uh, and I think, you know, you've got companies like Ford and like GM and like Toyota who have a much, even though we see them as slow to adopt this technology, they have a much more realistic view of, of exactly what it's going to take to make this practical. All right, let's, let's push forward a little bit in the story. 
Now, we know that this partnership with GM and Lyft happens because GM owns half a billion dollars of Lyft. That's what they invested in that company. Uh, and we also know that they're probably going to be doing the, most of their testing in California, specifically in San Francisco, a little bit in Los Angeles, and then they're going to be scattered across Lyft locations across the United States just, just to check. They probably will still be having a Lyft driver inside the car, but they're going to be using this test, this rollout, as, as a, a way to look at real-world deployment strategies. For example, I, I did mention earlier on in the bite that yesterday there was a crash of a Tesla near Dallas, Texas on the highway because of a really, really poorly designed barrier. It just kind of popped out into the lane. No cones, no nothing. The, the Tesla didn't notice it until it was too late. The avoidance system kicked in, but there was a car over to the right. And so it basically hit the barrier, deployed the airbags, and then sort of ground to a halt. We're going to see much more of those kinds of incidents. There's, there's going to be more and more of these uh, things that were not planned for, that were not programmed for. But, and Lou, I want to throw, throw it back to you. When do we see the completion of, of the looping cycle? Because the way that this typically works is uh, we will have a technology that is deployed, then things will happen with that technology, and then you change both the technology and the environment in which the technology is deployed. So at some point, roads start getting designed so that autonomous cars will navigate them better. When does that happen? <laughs> it's always innovation first and then innovation kind of pushes things forward. I think that's kind of the, the key. And, and when does it happen? It, it happens a lot faster nowadays. I mean, you'll start to see, you know, innovation come along that will push not only governments, but also industries forward to support that type of technology. And I think, um, you know, I think you'll start to see more and more. Um, you're already starting to see, you know, uh, small towns uh, produce these magnetic strips in the, in the streets and and uh, to be able to support these types of vehicles. And I think that that will happen sooner than later, and especially in large cities where people like to uh, to get in traffic jams. And I think, you know, this will also help, like like Curtis was saying, from a perspective from you know you know, transcontinental kind of, uh, travel to have to support that. Um, you, you have to, you have to have some kind of infrastructure in there. Um, you know, there's all these different technologies that, that are doing that people are, uh, different industries are using for autonomous vehicles today. There's not any one standard, which is unfortunate yet, um, that they've kind of, you know, zoned in upon. And I think that that will be one problem that will prevent the industry from, developing infrastructure to support the technology because there's not one technology that they need to support. Um, and so once they hone in on that one standard, whatever that might be, you know, whatever combination of technology it might be, then I'm, um, you know, then, then it'll start pushing the infrastructure to start to support it, especially as more people adapt it. So as more consumers and commercial ad adaptation comes through, you'll start to see the industry move through, uh, and, and kind of adapt to it, but it's always after the fact. Yeah, and unfortunately, that's that's the case. When this technology does make its big emergence, and it's not going to be a day that suddenly we say, okay, we're all autonomous now. It's going to be a slow, slow rollout where more and more companies start competing in this space. One or two companies will get the formula right, will become the popular choice. Everyone's going to model after the, the, uh, the version of the technology that they've used, and then we will start to see the emergence. Now, when I say 2018, of course, the story said 2018 could be the year of the autonomous car. It means that that's the year that we're going to start seeing deployment. Ford is already saying, look, we know we're going to be ready in 2020. So by 2020, you're at least going to have two major car manufacturers who are on the autonomous boat. I think that makes a difference. Curtis, we got to move on, but let's let's just do this really fun part. I'm actually looking <clears throat> forward to this being test, tested in San Francisco. Um, and um, would you take an autonomous taxi? Would you take a lift with no driver? You just jump in the back seat. Oh, sure. Um, and, and I'll be honest, I am looking forward to the day when we do have autonomous cars. Um, I enjoy driving under some circumstances, but there are a lot of occasions when I just want to get from one place to another. And uh, if an autonomous system can do it um, safely, cleanly, efficiently, and uh, uh, most important, economically, uh, I'm all for it. Uh, do, do I anticipate a lot of societal disruption? Uh, yeah, but uh, societal disruption seems to be the order of the day rather than an exception these days. So um, let's bring it on, embrace it, and uh, see where it takes us. Yeah, I'm sort of the same way. I also think that 
once you start seeing these types of vehicles actually being used for Lyft and, and Uber and any drive or car sharing services, people will, will say, okay, this, this was nice. I didn't get into an accident. This is the next car I will buy. I think that's, that's really going to be the impetus. It's going to be you ride in one and say, this wasn't the life-destroying experience I thought it was going to be. So maybe now I need to think about that, making this for my, my next car purchase. Lou, what about you? You've got a family. You know, you've got kids you have to worry about. Would you trust them to the autonomous car? Would you put your kids, I know they're really small right now, but would you put your kids into a car and say, hey, car, take them to school? <laughs> Honestly, I wouldn't. I, I actually fear uh, getting into one in a Tesla, which I've tried before, and trying it, just letting go of the wheel. I, f I have a sense of fear when that happens. Uh, I just, I don't know why. Um, and so I, I, at this point, I, I guess I won't, I wouldn't. It's okay, Lou. We have medication for that.